God says, I'm not moving until you get so upset with your circumstance that you're willing to cry out and when you call on me, I will answer. What if I told you that a cry is the signal to God that I'm ready to be delivered? And the enemies that we see today, we shall see no more. I need every Moses online and every Moses in this building to shout, we are coming out. Genesis 26. I'm going to read, sorry team, I, I told you King James, I'm changing it. I'm going to New English translation. Uh, NET version of the Bible. It's in Genesis 26, verse 1. The Bible says, And there was a famine in the land subsequent to the earlier famine that occurred in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Touch your neighbor and say, Don't go there. Settle down in the land that I will point out to you. Stay in this land, then I will be with you, and then I will bless you. For I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants, and I will fulfill the solemn promise I've made to your father Abraham. Some of y'all are about to get what God promised your mother that he would give you. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. All right. And he says, all the nations of the earth will pronounce blessings on one another using the name of your descendants. Now I want you to go down to verse 12, because what we just found out is that there is a famine in the land. Do we all agree? Yeah. There is a famine in the land. That means everything's dried up. The animals are dying. The crop has died. There is no water. Everything's dried up. Now, when you get to verse 12, one thing I do know, is that you cannot plant in the desert. Is it, is it not true? <clears throat> but the Bible says when Isaac planted in that land, in a dry place, he reaped. Not next year, in the same year. Not just the seed that he planted, but a hundred times what he had sown because the Lord blessed him. Look at verse 13, go to the next verse. The Bible says in verse 13 that the man became wealthy. His influence continued to grow. God is not just giving you money, he's getting ready to give you influence. And for those of you who don't know, influence is way more valuable than money. You keep you keep counting your bank account, God says, I'm, check, your, <laughs> check your influence account. Because I'm gonna turn this influence into increase. And watch this, he continued to grow until he became very prominent. Last verse, go to verse 14. He had so many sheep and cattle and such a great household of servants that the Philistines, now watch this, why you up here shouting? You're going to have to make sure all your books is right. You're going to have to make sure that your click is tight. You're going to have to make sure that you got the right because once you get it, they are going to become. Please hear me. Anybody building, look at me. Anybody building, look at me. Let me give you a, um, a hack. When you are building, everybody loves you. Because most people don't have a problem helping you build because to them it says you haven't arrived yet. But the moment you get there, the same people that helped you build it, if they can't find an equal place in your future with you, they will start to try 
Okay. Your boy told you, you better hear me. So right now she's saying, I love you. You my friend, friend. That's my best friend. That's my friend, friend. We friends, right, friend? Start balling. They gonna say, she changed. She, when she ain't had nothing, she called me all the time. See, when you get busy, they get broken. See, right now, the worst thing that's going on in your life is you got too, many, you got too much time for your friends. When you start getting busy, you don't have time no more, and they ain't doing nothing. Y'all better hear this word. God told me to tell every one of you. Matter of fact, let me help you help somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God told me to tell you. I don't know if you know it, but you are on the edge of evidence. I thought I, thought I had... Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I need everybody who's on the edge of a miracle to shout in this place. I'm on the edge of evidence. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. All the close people make some noise. So there is, there is a term um, in legality, I heard y'all. Bunch of millionaires over here. Yeah, that's what the that's the rich section. But I think the billionaires are over here. Or oh, maybe over here. Maybe over. Maybe up there. I want you to even expand your language. A million dollars is easy. Hey man, listen, you my kind of dude, you know what I'm saying? Love you, man. There's a term in legal recourse called, I heard that, called corpus delecti. It's a rule. Corpus delecti is the idea that just because you admit to a crime doesn't mean you can be convicted. I already preached. All right, I'll see y'all later. Thank y'all for coming out. God bless you. Good night. There is corpus delecta. It says that if there is a crime that has been committed, and I go down and I say, I did it, they can't convict me because of my confession. They can only convict me if they find proof. So, for instance, if I am guilty of larceny, which is to steal someone else's property, if they can't find the evidence, then they cannot convict me because a conviction is not predicated on an admission. You are only guilty when they can prove it. It's like anyone who unfortunately has had their house burned down. I can come over your house and tell you I'm gonna cook and burn the house down because I can't. But I can't go to jail for arson because in order to go to jail for arson, they have to prove criminal act. So without criminality, it is simply an insurance claim. And it's my bad, dog. I didn't mean to do it, but I don't go to prison because there was not criminality in the proceedings. Is any of this making sense? So Corpus Delecta says that in order to be convicted of anything, there must be substantial Evidence. Everybody say evidence. evidence. Say it again. Say evidence. evidence. So the Latin word, let me, let me just get this out because I, I think it's important. The Latin word evidentia means proof. It means proof. Uh, in the classical Latin distinction of the vivid presentation of the word, it means clearness. Everybody say clearness. clearness. The stem of the Latin evidence means obvious and apparent. Everybody say obvious and apparent. Obvious. So when the, the word was first mentioned in the 14th century, which is 700 years ago, the original usage of the word 
evidence actually meant grounds for belief. Hear me. What am I saying? God is about to do so much with your life that anybody who's looking at it will start to believe in his power because of what they see God doing in your life. You missed it. I am not saying that God's about to just give you evidence. I'm saying that God is about to make you evidence. That he's gonna do so much with your life that people who have no hope will look at where you started and where you're going and they're gonna take a shot on God because they know your story and they also see your glory. If you don't hear anything that I'm gonna say for the rest of the day, know that in this next season, God is not just about to move you from stage to stage. Some of you all are about to take quantum leaps. Your five-year plan is about to become a five-month reality. I'm under the anointing right now. Y'all better get it while I'm under it because I might not be under it later on. What God is about to do in this next season is to take your plan, throw it away, and then reward you for having one in the first place. And then reveal himself and say, what you had planned is not what I had in mind. But because of your faith and patience in me and your trust in my ability, God is gonna get involved in your circumstance and he's gonna turn weeks into days. He's gonna turn days into minutes. He's gonna turn minutes into seconds. And before you know it, you're gonna look up and say, what in the world happened? How did I get here? And hopefully at the end of that, you will say, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. Can I just find anybody in the house who's not going to wait to the end of the sermon when I'm sweating and screaming to give God the glory that your latter days are going to be better than your former. I remember a preacher said to me, and I'm going to, I'm going to relay this to you. He said, God is going to bless you so much. Listen to me. He said, son, that the worst days of your future are going to be better than the best days of your past. Did you hear what I just said? That means that when it's bad for you tomorrow, it's still going to be better than it was yesterday. If you believe it, say amen. So as we look at the text, Isaac is one of the big three patriarchs. You've heard this. There are three. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At least 30 times in the Bible, we see the Bible say that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see this grouping, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, who are these three guys? They are not just acquaintances. They are kin. Abraham is the father. Isaac is the son. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham and the son of Isaac. Does that make sense? Now, he says to Abraham, watch this. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you as many as the stars in the sky. Then he says something because we've never seen the, the, the galaxy, so we can't really conceptualize that. But then he says something for those of us who are on earth. He says, I'm going to bless you as, the, as much as the sand on the ocean. Did you hear the words? That it, he said, I'm going to bless you. The way I'm going to bless you is equivalent to you going to every beach and counting the sand. <laughs> grain by grain. How long would it take you to count the entire world? You don't have enough time to count it all. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. 
that way. Abraham dies and doesn't see it. Isaac is born, but Isaac is not Abraham's first son. Abraham tried to rush the process because God told him that he would do it through his son. So he says, okay, well, all right, God, I'm 100 years old and my wife is 102 and the math ain't mathing. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, even if you can have a baby at 90, do you want to? So I want y'all to imagine a 90-year-old woman walking around the stilettos with a baby. You're talking about the highest risk of pregnancy that the earth has ever seen. And so what she does is she outsources it to a woman named Hagar. Hagar has a son, but his name is Ishmael, not Isaac, because Ishmael is not the one that God promised. Are you listening to me? Now watch what happens. He has Isaac's second. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Now we see the promise happening because Jacob has 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel, which inside of the tabernacle are the 12 loaves of showbread that are on the table of showbread. So now what you see is now all of Jacob's sons start to have sons. And now God's promise is being kept because after the third generation, through the third generation, God starts to birth what he said in the first generation. Now, I don't know who this is for, but your name isn't Abraham. Your name isn't Isaac. Your name is Jacob, which means that what God promised Abraham, let me change the name. What God promised Stella, what's your mama name? What God promised Earl, what's your daddy name? Whatever God promised them is getting ready to come through you. I want to see the people in the room that knows that you are about to see what God promised somebody in your family three generations ago. If you believe it, just touch yourself and say, it must be me. It must be me. It must be me that's getting ready to break the financial curse in this. It must be me that's going to take care of my mother. It must be me that's going to be able to help my siblings. It must be me. How do I know it's me? Because all the hell I've been through, all of the lessons that I had to learn, Every year that I said this was the toughest year of my life and somehow God kept making a way. If you see God switching pieces, if you see God playing musical chairs in your life, if you see God bringing unlikely people in your life, it's because God is about to push the start button on your life. And he who has began a good work in you is going to establish it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you start to realize you are on the edge of evidence, you get out of the back of your seat and on the edge of your seat, some of you will be on your feet praising God in advance because the evidence is about to show up. Repeat after me, I got evidence and I got confidence. Jacob, and those of y'all standing up, do me a favor. Stay standing up. Because the rest, no, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Because what I'm about to say next, the rest of them are going to try to, they're going to try to get in. But they weren't in in the beginning. This, this network marketing, you got to get in on the ground floor. Watch this. Watch this. I'm about to show you something. I'm about to show you something. Let me show you why this is important. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. Jacob lived to be 147. Okay? 147 years old. Abraham lived to be 175. Isaac lived to be 180. And yet, the Bible talks more about Abraham and Jacob than it does Isaac. You got all of these chapters dedicated to Abraham. You got all of these chapters dedicated to Jacob. And we got to get all the way to Genesis chapter 26 to get an entire chapter dedicated to Isaac. Isaac lived the longest, but he was talked about the least. Oh, y'all better hear me. You better hear me. 
All of these chapters, Abraham, 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 chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, 15, Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, 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 Jacob. Oh, God, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. But nobody's talking about Isaac until we get to chapter 26. And then God turns his head towards Isaac. And spends an entire chapter talking about him. Can I help somebody who's looking at people whose life seems to be going well? And you're looking at everybody else and it seems to be their time. God sent me to tell you for your patience, I'm about to turn the page. And now this chapter belongs to you. If I can get about 500 people that to give somebody a high five and say, it's my time now. This is my chapter. This is my season. And don't hate on me because I was congratulating you. I was happy when it was your turn. I called you and told you congratulations. Now it's my turn. I want to see anybody who can be selfish for a moment and thank God that your season has come. Do me a favor, high five your neighbor, say it's your time, it's your season. I prophesy money in your pocket. I prophesy health in your family. I prophesy opportunities that will fall in front of you. I prophesy that your name would have so much influence that everywhere you go when they say your name, things will change. Somebody shout, it's my chapter. Tell somebody I'm next. I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been congratulating people the last three years. I can't tell you how many people I call to say, congratulations on your new car. How many house warmers have you been to just congratulating people going back to your apartment? Talking about, Lord, when is it going to be my turn? I came to announce to you. It's here. It's your turn. It's your time. Your miracle has arrived. If you believe the words that are coming out of my mouth. I love it. Because you've been telling everybody else congratulations. How many of y'all, you just been congratulating, you've been on a congratulations tour for the last three years. How many, how many baby showers you done been to buying diapers, still asking God to be able to conceive? Your chapter has finally arrived. And because of your patience and your lack of envy and hatred and jealousy, when it was somebody else's season, you hear me, young lady? God says it is your time. You just keep turning that page because your chapter and your season is upon you. And do me a favor. When your chapter comes, please don't act like you the book. Don't start getting all funny acting. It. Getting all arrogant and got a little stank attitude. I want to see if you can still be humble when you got money in your pocket. Will you still speak to people when you got gas money, will you still have a good spirit? If I'm talking to you, holler at your boy. Somebody just yelled chapter 26. God is turn, oh yeah, just say it all then, go ahead. God, okay, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm done with y'all. I'm, I'm, the Lord is about to. Lord, then just say it then. Some of them like, I'm going to confess with my mouth. I've been trying to hold y'all back all day. Please forgive me. God is about to turn the page. And all of your life, somebody got a Bible or a book I can just hold? The Lord just gave me a revelation. Just anything. I don't care what it is. Oh, all right. He understands the anointing. He wants my hand on his book. Imagine 
this is your chapter. And all of your life, you've had all of these pages on you. And all you felt was the weight and the darkness of not knowing when it was your turn. But pages are so light that you did not know. Little by little, God, without an explanation, was turning the page. And today, the reason why some of y'all feel lighter than you've ever felt is because God went from doing it a little bit at a time. Slap three people and say, my chapter has come. God is about to shift your life because you are on the edge. Somebody shout, I'm on the edge of evidence. Say it again, I'm on the edge of evidence. I want you to say it like you mean it. I'm on the edge of evidence. Hmm. I'm about to give you the for sure way of knowing that your chapter is about to come. 100% accuracy. This is the truth. It is irrefutable. I'm about to show you how to know when it's your turn. Y'all don't want it. Let me move on. Put my little watch back on, y'all. I ain't got. To, I am not gonna cast my pearls to swine if you don't want it. I ain't giving it to you. All right. Go ahead and preach, Tristan. I'm done. They don't want it. You don't want it. All right. I'm about to show you, Chris said, I, I do security, I do not preach, bro. <laughs> I'm about to show you how you know it's your turn. I'm about to show you. I'm telling you, I'm about to show you, man. Like soon. Eventually. Right now? All right, Ed, this is how you know. Keon, this is how you know. Okay, Yakiris, this is how you know. Tony, this is how you know. All right, Brother Wendell, this is how you know. Keisha, this is how you know. Barbara, this is how you know. Ruth, this is how you know. Miss Hickman, this is how you know. Kelly, this is how you know. Sarge, this is how you know. John the Baptist, this is how you know. Tyra, this is how you know. You ready? Brother Wyatt, this is how you know. O.C., this is how you know. Skylar, this is how you know. Clarence, this is how you know. You ready? You're in a famine. God ain't about to move because everything is going well. The way you know God about to do something is everything you depended on started to dry up. <laughs> I feel God in this room. Tyrone, the way you know that God is about to move is the first thing he does is he dries everything up. Abraham, I'm going to bless you as much as the stars in the sky. He's getting ready to bless him through Isaac. What is the blessing? The blessing is the land. So Abraham dies and is about to hand the land over to his son. And when Abraham had it, it was flowing with milk and honey. D, when he gets it, it's a desert. My question for you is can you trust God when the thing you're waiting on 
doesn't come like you expected it. Feel me? Because God, I got a question. Why is it that the thing that you gave me when it was in somebody else's hand, it was working? And now that you gave it to me, it's dried up. Now you're going to give me a complex because I'm going to start thinking you love them more than you love me. God says, you don't even know me. I give you broken things so I can fix them. God gives Isaac the land and everything in it is dying. What do you do when what you've been waiting for isn't what you had in mind? I bet you I can find 2,000 people in this building that have messed up their future because God didn't do it the way you expected. You had your whole plan. It's going to come at, I'm going to be 26, and, and, and shut your mouth. You might as well stop that. The older, the older you, re, you get, you start realizing all of that stuff that you got in your book. I'm going to have this by I'm 25. I'm going to have this by I'm 30. I'm going to have this by I'm 35. You're going to miss God because it doesn't come in the form you expect it. Who would have ever thought that the thing that Isaac was going to, that he was going to receive from God would be dry? I mean, if I'm going to get it from God, I expect it to have 22s on it, you know? I mean, if God give it, it can't come with hubcaps. The way you know that God's about to transform your life is it looks like this. But the surface is not an indicator because anybody will tell you that the only reason why a cactus or any other branch or bush or tree that can live in the desert is because it found out that if it sends the roots deep enough, it will eventually find water. Your problem is you won't dig. You want God to put it on the surface? You want to come to church two times and clap and spin around? And then the miracle is there? But what if you got to dig? Deep. You got to dig deep to find out what's in your heart that keeps you from succeeding. You got to dig deep to find out what it is about your personality that keeps God from blessing you. And you can put your cigarettes down and still not be blessed. And you can stop smoking and still be miserable. And you can stop drinking and cussing and think God gonna bless you. But if you don't dig deep, you're gonna be a sober, miserable person. I hope I'm talking to somebody. I said, I hope I'm talking to somebody. Anybody need me to prove it? How many of y'all remember when Ruth met Boaz? What happened? Naomi took her away from a famine. And Boaz was in the field. And she went and slept under him. Had it not been for a famine, she would have never found Boaz. Because if it don't dry up where you are, you'll never get where you should be. Let me tell you what God is doing. God is starving you out of the place where you're comfortable. And he's going to dry it up until you start to move.
The only reason why Ruth met Boaz is because there was a famine where she was living. The famine forces you out of your comfort zone. The famine makes you say, I can't stay here. I don't know where I'm going, but I can't go back there. The famine makes you take risk. The famine will have you out here trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. The, the famine will have you out here broke but smiling and worshiping. The famine will have you out here searching. The famine will have you out here pretending to be happy but miserable inside. The famine will force you to find a new location. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a famine. Famine will have you searching. Who loves me? Who, who cares for me? Who can I believe? Who can I trust? Because you can get so hurt in the famine that you don't even know how to trust success. And when God does really send you somebody worth your time, you miss them because you got a famine mind. That's how you know he's getting ready to do something. Is you can't find anything that isn't dried up. It's how you know that the favor of God is on your life. If it wasn't for the famine, Elijah would have never went to the widow's house. And if Elijah would have never went to the widow's house, y'all hear me in the balcony? I see four men standing up looking at me, eyeball to eyeball. I'm going to look at you too, bro. Look at me. Look at me. If it wasn't for the famine, you wouldn't know that God could be watered in dry places. You hear me, dude? So, so here, here's what I'm saying to you. The famine drove you here today. If you had everything you needed, you wouldn't be here today. God has a way of driving you to him and he dries up what you depend on. That means your job the woman you depended on. The friends you thought you had. He'll dry all of that up so that you'll learn that you didn't need none of them in the first place. That's right, bro, clap. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. I want to see a response to God. He'll dry it up so he can fill it up. And when that prophet showed up to that woman's house in a famine, it was in the famine that she realized that every time she was going to dip in that barrel, God was going to fill it up. Because what you must understand is that when you are in the will of God, he doesn't have to give you anything new. He'll just multiply what you already have. He'll take two fish, five loaves of bread, and every time you go to reach, He'll break it and bless it, and he'll multiply. Anybody know that God can multiply the little bit that you have? Just touch three people and say, a little can go a long way. So this is what I want you to do for five seconds. For everybody who's in the famine, I don't want you to lift up your head. Okay? This is what I want you to do over the next five seconds. Instead of complaining about your famine, can you act like you're in the land flowing with milk and honey? Can you just act like it's all good? Can you just worship him in spirit? All right. If you want me to go deeper, say go deeper. All right, watch this. I want to show you something in the text. Isaac, though, when he sees that the land is dry, just imagine, just imagine, I don't know how it happened, but just imagine he was at the, at the funeral in the last will and testament, and the lawyer says to you, Isaac, your father bequeaths you the land. Here are the keys. And Isaac turns around, and this is what he sees. Said, Lord, you left me. How many of y'all have been like, you can keep this, Lord, because 
And oh my God, oh Jesus, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Because what I'm about to say now, woo-wee! I'm about to convict some of y'all and me too. <laughs> Let me start with myself so that what you don't think, I'm just talking to you. When Isaac got what he was promised, but it wasn't what he expected, he did what most people do. He ran. I want to know how many runners are in the room. Every time it don't feel like you thought it was going to feel. All of a sudden, the Lord speaking to you. I can't, I guess I got to pick me. I got to find my happiness. It ain't about you. It's about me. Where in the Bible has it ever told you to consider yourself? Find me one scripture where God says, choose me. Yet this internet sensational buzz up. I got to choose me. When has God ever told you to pick yourself? Find me one scripture. Where he said, I got to do me. No greater man has any man than this, that he will lay down his life for a friend. You don't find peace doing you. You find peace serving them. And in spite of how they treat you, you got to give of yourself. God. Because picking you makes you an idol. And when you pick yourself, then you are left to take care of yourself. Paul put it this way. He says, therefore, I have turned you over to a reprobate mind. In other words, God says, if you're going to pick you and not let me take care of you after I've already promised that if my eyes are on the sparrow, my eyes are on you. So since you want to fight your battle, I'm going to turn you over to your own mind. But... When I turn you over to yourself, you are also responsible for protecting yourself. And that's why you are broken, is because you're playing God for you. When it comes to your finances and it comes all this, I'm gonna give it to God. But when it comes to your battles, you wanna fight yourself. You gotta figure out where God begins and where you end. And you can't keep up picking up God's mantle when you're uncomfortable with how it looks. Preach the word, Keon. Whether y'all say man or ouch, you are gonna say something up in here. So we wanna be God's assistant. So when God ain't doing what we wanna do, God, I got this, I, I got, I'll let you take over once. He ran. That's what most of us do. When we don't get, when we don't, when we don't feel comfortable, we run. When when we can't manage our emotions, we run. When we can't, when, when we can't manage our mindsets, we run. And you've been running and running. And when you got where you were running, you were still in motion. And you got there, you might have been happy for a month or two, but you're already ready to go. Because you were running from what's yours. Not knowing that God can make it look like it once looked. But you must wait on the Lord, I say, Touch two people say, wait on him, wait on him, wait on him, wait on him, wait on him. He's coming, you got, you got to wait on him. He, he's on his way, but you got to wait on him. Isaac does what a lot of us do. Can I preach now? Because all that other stuff wasn't the real sermon. This is the real sermon because y'all quiet. I know when I'm talking. When Isaac runs, he does what most of us do. 
we let the circumstance make our decisions for us. It's hard. I quit. Well, God knew you were a quitter. That's why he didn't give you the glory. Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you will quit when it's hard, you will also quit when it's good. Because sometimes good is harder than hard. We were, I was, I preached in Greensboro, North Carolina, day before yesterday. And walking through the airport, lady comes up and she says, this is hilarious. She's like, can we take a picture? I don't mind taking a picture with nobody, I promise you. But when, when y'all do this, let me, let me see your phone, Destiny. When y'all do this, can, does they, can we take a picture? Yeah, because I was just watching you uh, the other day online. Ooh, I can't get this thing working. And, um, and I'll just be like, you don't, if you don't hurry up and get that camera on. So what I'm thinking in my mind. You can't say that. You can't say that. She's probably nervous. You got to consider what she's going through. Then, then she says, all right, you want to take the selfie? She said, ooh, my arm's too short. You're going to have to do it. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, all right. Come on, ma'am. So I took the selfie, and I realized that she probably has seen me so many times, she never knew what she would do if we ever came in contact. So because I understand the weight of my assignment, I have to talk to my flesh and make sure that I respond in the spirit, even though my flesh tells me to be frustrated. And that is when God can bless you because if you can't talk to you, he can't either. If you ignore that st small, still voice, then God says, I can't trust you with the assignment because you will let your flesh win every time. What will tell you, every step we took, here comes another person. Why would I be upset? This is what I have to tell myself. Why would I be upset when I spent my whole life to impact people and then have an attitude when they respond to the impact? And is it hard? Yes. Can it be frustrating? Yes. Am I in a hurry? Absolutely. But what is the, ris what is the risk? of mistreating an individual who already has an adverse perspective of religion and God and they get an opportunity to meet his representative and I act like the people who don't represent him? What am I saying to you? Don't ask God for the land. Don't ask him for the business. Don't ask him for the notoriety. Don't ask him for the opportunity and then treat people a certain way once you get there. If God ever blesses you, act like you would want somebody to act. If it were you. So when he does do it, and when money isn't a problem, and they know your name everywhere you go, you still look a man and a woman in the eye and be grateful for the opportunity that they even know you exist. Because there is an alternative. Nobody could be concerned about who you are. Can God trust you with influence? Can God trust you with opportunity? What, what, what is it going to hurt you to say, ah, nice to meet you too? What is it going to hurt you to reach your hand out and shake something? I'm a germaphobe. You touch nasty stuff all day. To include yourself. And all of a sudden you can't shake nobody's hand because you got 2,000 followers on Instagram. Give me a break. Since when did your hands become more germaphobic because you got followers on Instagram? This is the stuff this, this generation need to hear. Yeah. Glory to God. 
The will of God is not determined by what you had in mind. Everybody say sovereignty. sovereignty. Do you know what that means? That means God does what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants, and for whoever he wants. He's sovereign. That means he can say, oh, da, 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 da. Tara Johnson, I pick you. And he ain't got to explain it to Billy. He's sovereign. I'm standing before you today because he's sovereign. Ain't no reason I'm supposed to be up here. But he's sovereign. Can you imagine? He said, all right, Gwen Scott, I'm going to put a boy in your care and he's going to preach the gospel to the world and y'all going to come from Gary, Indiana and you're going to work at Taco Bell and you're going to raise them. You think my mama believed that? You think she would have believed that if God told her that? So God didn't tell her that. But what he did tell her, make sure he treats his elders with respect. Make sure he has an attitude of gratitude. He told her what to put in me, not she not knowing that I was going to need it when I got to my assignment. I didn't know, how was, how, did, how was I going to end up in Houston, Texas? Somebody tell me how that was going to work. From Gary, Indiana. Who from Gary? Oh, I feel glory. Oh, Lord, I feel glory. You from Gary, too? Oh, I feel glory all over y'all life. Y'all see how we ain't scared to tell nobody where we from? I'm glad you're here too, man. Yes, <laughs> Psalms 34, 19. How many of y'all been going through a lot lately? How many of y'all are shocked by how much you've been going through? Let me unshock you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. So I know, I know you got that thing in your belly because I know it's going to happen. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, and that's where most of us stop. But can I tell you the second part of the verse? But the Lord delivereth him out of them. What if I told you that this is the season where everything that dried up in your life, God is about to deliver it. That's the kind of praise where you think he's going to do some stuff, Christina, but not other stuff. But here's the word of the Lord. I'm getting ready to deliver you from it. And since he's getting ready to deliver you from it all, can you give him all the praise that he deserves? Come on, somebody give it all to him. If you stop right now, you're going to stay discouraged. Why would you stop and you're on Just, just one swift wind gonna push you into it. How many of y'all ever, how many of y'all scared of, of, of water? Don't like people playing around swimming pools. Let me, let me tell y'all something. For all of y'all who ain't black, black folks, they so scared of swimming pools. It's two things most black people are scared of, water and dogs. And the reason why we scared of both of them is because we ain't had no swimming pool and we ain't had no dogs. And the only dog we knew was a dog in the hood that bit everybody that had ever seen. So, so most black people don't do dogs. And when they do get one, they get one this big. 
so that if it do bite them, it don't kill them. But you ain't never, you ain't gonna see too many black people walking with a Doberman pitcher because they see the dog, they be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Black people don't even like people who let their dogs jump on people. Why would they do that? Why would they just let them dogs be on people like that? Everybody don't like dogs. Black people, holler at me if I'm talking about you. Next thing black folks don't do is they don't play around swimming pools. Black people don't, number one, they don't want their hair messed up. They don't spend too much time in the beauty shop for their edges to be attacked by the chlorine, so they ain't got time for it. Number one, it's all about the hairstyle. That's number one. But it don't matter, because if they're at the end of the hairstyle, they'll get their hair wet, because they know they're getting their hair done in two days. Just for anybody who don't know. This is what black people do when they get to the edge of swimming pools. All right, it look nice. Go and get in, it's warm, I'm cool. This is how black people test water to see if it's warm enough to get in. Go, 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 go. Oh, no, no, I ain't even getting in that. that just, that's too cold, that's too cold. Water be 85 degrees. Black people need it to be 92. <laughs> no, nah, they ain't getting in. Because truth is, we don't play around edges. You don't see us falling off no cliffs? Because if we get to one, oh, that's a long way down. We don't play around edges. And if I get close to an edge and you push me in it, I swear for God in buttermilk, two things gonna happen. Either you coming in with me or if I get out, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, cause it's going Do me a favor, grab your neighbor by the hand. Tell him, I know you scared of edges, but what God has for you is on the other side of the edge. And I'm about to pull you in with me because the evidence is on the other side of the edge. Now I dare you start pulling that person. I'm not gonna let you stay comfortable. I'm not gonna let you stay scared. I'm about to pull you to the next dimension. Come on and pull it. I said, come on and pull it. Come on and pull it, come on, come on, find somebody, pull them, pull them. Tell them neighbor, I love you too much to let you stay in your comfort zone. I love you too much to let you settle for where you are. So forgive me, but I'm about to pull you into your destiny. Listen, even if they resist, pull them. If you sit next to somebody and you standing up and they sitting down, pull their butt up. Tell them I refuse to let you stay comfortable in this season. Now grab a neighbor by the hand and shout neighbor. God told me to tell you that your evidence is on the other side of the edge. Is your neighbor pulling you back? Tell him, let my hand go. I need to find somebody who ain't scared to go to the next dimension. Grab a new neighbor by the hand and shout, neighbor, weeping me endure for night, but joy. It's getting ready to come in the morning. Do you got the right neighbor? It kind of look all right, but I'm looking for another level of glory. Maybe you need two neighbors because one can chase a thousand. 
but two can put 10,000 a flight. I want you to find your two neighbors and say, neighbor, when I move, you move just like that. Uh, you got your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, I'm about to take two steps forward and I'm not taking three steps back because I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the upward call. Do you got your neighbor? One, two, uh, did they move with you? You got the wrong click. Ah, I feel glory in the room. Grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, God said everything is going to be all right. Do you believe it? If you know the evidence is here, open up your mouth and begin to give God the glory. Shout it, yeah. Shout it, yeah. Shout it, yeah. Yeah. Shout it, yeah. Shout it, yeah. Shout yeah. I feel glory in this place. I said, I feel glory in this place. Paul said, I planted Apollos water, but God provided the increase. Shout increase. The Bible says that the Philistines had planted seeds in the same land for years and nothing happened. I want you to hear me. They planted seeds in the same land and nothing happened. But because Isaac was on the edge, he came and planted seeds in the same place that they planted and nothing happened. And for him, the Bible says in the same year, he got a hundredfold increase. Don't let what they did make you think that that's what God's going to do. It wasn't a chapter, but now it's yours. And God says, you about to win where you saw others lose. Touch five people say, go ahead and plant, baby. Go ahead and plant. Go ahead and start the business. Go ahead and open the company. Go ahead and write the vision. Go ahead and make it plain because this is your year of the 100 fold blessing. I want to hear the sound of 1,000 times. My dollars about to turn into hundreds. My hundreds in the thousands. My thousands in the hundreds of thousands. My hundreds of thousands in the millions. If you believe it, I need to hear a 100 fold praise. He planted in the same place. He did the same thing they were doing. But because it was his chapter, he did the same thing they were doing. He was in the same place they were in. They were sinners, he was sinners. They were imperfect, he was imperfect. They had told lies, he had told lies. So what happened? It was his time. And when it's your time, no devil in hell, listen to me, you can't even mess up the, poverty, the sovereign plan of God. The thing about being at the edge is you started back here. And, and you mean to tell me you're going to get all the way? Because life ain't always a straight line. It's
I can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. I can't. I will. I will. I will. I shouldn't. I'm scared. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No seed. Come too far to turn around now. It doesn't get any closer than this. Now all you got to do is walk by. And I am telling you what I know. I am not telling you what I heard. I am telling you what I have had to do myself. It don't come easy. And watch what happens. In the land that God gave him, the Bible says that there were wells that had been dug by his father Abraham. And mama, when he got the wells, the people who were jealous of him, the Bible says they filled the wells with dirt. You think you just gonna get the well and the people who planted where you planted and didn't get anything are just gonna be happy when you get it? Kirk, they filled it with dirt. And you know what Isaac had to do? He had a decision. Either he was going to spend his efforts getting even with the people who plugged the dirt in the wells, or he would realize that vengeance is God's, and he would use his efforts to unplug the well. I need you Focus on your assignment, not on your enemies. Don't you spend no time getting anybody back. Because by the time you get them back, you won't have energy to restore what the devil has tried to take from you. And you talking to somebody, ma'am, let me tell you, my second nature is to fight. That's what I know how to do. What I am learning how to do is be still. And let me tell you, oh, it's the battle of your life to be in a new season and have to use a new method. But be of good courage and be of good cheer. He who has began a good work in you shall establish it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you're in this place today 
and you absolutely know that you're on the edge and you can absolutely feel a force trying to push you away from that edge I just want you to raise your hands in this place you have to know my heart I, I promise you I would if I could I would come and touch every one of you It's just what's in my heart to do. I would, I would sit down at Wingstop with you and eat some lemon pepper chicken wings and just talk about whatever's on your heart. That's what's in my heart to do. But it would be getting in the way of you hearing the voice of God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord will deliver us from them all. And I'm your pastor and I'm looking you right in your eye. And I am telling you that you are closer than you have ever been in your life. I'm still talking to you up there, bro. You are closer than you've ever been in your life. If you turn around now, you will forfeit every lesson you have been through. Be a strong man. Fight the good fight of faith. Trust him in the process. Before you know it, the edge becomes evidence. Come on, let's sing.